Fellow time travellers, thank God you're there. It's always great to have you with me as we travel through space and time. Better to be together than alone. Thanks, of course, to everyone who's subscribed to my YouTube channel. And thanks for your comments. It's always great to be in conversation with all of you. Paul and I, I, honestly, I cannot express in words strong enough how much it helps us to hear what you're all thinking. Topics that you've uh, that, that you draw our attention to uh, and the feedback. You know, I, I see the feedback, Paul sees all the feedback and it, it keeps us completely refreshed with an understanding of who you all are and, and what it is that makes you tick. Um, that's what this channel is all about. It's about paying attention to the past, uh, that it might help us better understand the present and so cope with the future, whatever it holds. Before we get started on today's episode, as always, thanks to the people who support the podcast series by membership of my Patreon.com site. Uh, It's that support that makes the love letters possible, so thank you to every one of you. If you're not a member yet and you'd like to be, go to Patreon.com, look for me by name, become a member, and you get access to exclusive content, question and answer sessions, competitions, and all of that. It would simply be great to have you as part of the family of time travellers, so do sign up. Come along, join the family and join the journey. Right, it's now time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off for the next stop in my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. so important to acknowledge the people that come along from time to time, men and women, who, unlike the rest of us, who just accept the uh, orthodoxy, that look at the evidence again and say to themselves and eventually to other people, I don't think so. I don't think that's right. In this podcast, we're climbing up a volcano with new scientific ideas fizzing around our ears. From the late 18th to the early 19th century, Edinburgh buzzed with new ways of thinking. It was a time when the city was said to be filled with geniuses and it became known as the centre of the Scottish Enlightenment. It's a place where the bare bones of the world are exposed for all to see. Against the prevailing beliefs of the day, one man dared to ask questions that had never been asked before. Around him, he realised, was evidence about how the world was made. Amongst the first to contemplate deep time, he confronted us with our insignificance in the face of eternity. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last podcast we set sail on a voyage of epic proportions with the legendary Captain Cook. Where are we this week? We're well and truly back on terra firma this week, Paul, uh, following in the footsteps of one James Hutton, a man who people call, quite rightly, the father of geology. He found himself in a city that, from its very location in the landscape, posed questions about how the world was created. Walking past Edinburgh Castle and climbing to the summit of Arthur's Seat, he helped science take a great leap into the future. We're in Edinburgh, not so very far from where I live, here in Stirling. And I suppose maybe when people think about Edinburgh, there's certain landmarks, I think, that everyone just consciously or unconsciously summons up. And there's the castle, obviously, up on its crag and tail. Then there's Arthur's Seat and Salisbury Crags. You know, there's surely images that come to people's minds when they think about Edinburgh. Because Edinburgh is so much a city that's famous for its geology. You maybe don't think about it in those terms, but really when you're impressed by the way that Edinburgh looks, that's why. It's correctly described 
like Rome, as a city built on seven hills, which you don't really see. If you arrive, let's say, at Waverley train station, which is famous way to arrive right in the heart of the city, and you pop up the stairs out onto Prince's Street and turn around and look at the castle, you don't necessarily get a sense of how bumpy the terrain actually is because in the 18th century and the 19th century, when the new town was built, the lovely Georgian new town, the old bumps and humps were engineered out of existence primarily by the construction of a set of bridges like North Bridge, George IV Bridge, that created an artificially level surface that smoothed out the natural terrain. And it gave rise to, you know, Edinburgh famously, or, or infamously really, you might say, has an underground city. Because of all this levelling off, it meant that out of sight and out of mind were lower levels that were engineered away. And so people, especially the poor, were living out of sight, down below the bridges, in sort of cavernous terrain underneath the modern city. So the, the point of all that... Well, actually, actually underground. Yeah, because Edinburgh's history, Edinburgh is known, was famously called Old Reeky, which means old smelly. Before the new town was built, the old town, which was basically on the slopes below the castle, the castle's up on its great volcanic rock, and then the Royal Mile slopes downhill. It's a feature that geologists call a crag and tail, uh, which is to say the, the crag is a massive block of volcanic rock spewed out hundreds of millions of years ago by volcanic activity. For a long time, in geological time, it would have been underground. It wouldn't have been visible. But during the last ice age, when the ice age came through, the great bulldozer of the ice pushed away all the soft rock and exposed the hard rock beneath. And the crag effectively acted like a kind of a shield for the wedge of softer material behind it. So the glacier had to break around it or go over the top of it. So you were left with the tail. So there's the crag, which is the volcanic rock, and then a sloping tail of softer material behind it. And that's what creates the slope that the Royal Mile is on. And the old town was all around that. And to some extent, there was even an amount of burrowing. So you had this old town that grew up and it was densely populated by the 1700s. You know, there were a lot of people packed into a relatively small space. You had some of the earliest, well, you couldn't call them skyscrapers, but, you know, there were 12 and 13, 14 storey buildings, higgledy-piggledy, created with poor people living in the lower levels where it was really smelly around all the, all the raw sewage and all the rubbish. And then the, the more affluent people lived higher up, up in the better air. Densely populated, and of course everyone's burning coal and, and wood and all the rest of it for fuel, so there was smoke everywhere. There was no proper modern sewage arrangements that we would understand, so a, a lot of waste was just dumped in the, in the street. So it was old reeky. And then the new town was built, because during the Enlightenment in the 1700s, early 1800s, there were lots of well-to-do people in Edinburgh, and they weren't impressed with the fact that they were living in these <laughs> unhygienic conditions. So they decided to build themselves a nice new town on the other side of what became Prince's Street, Prince's Street Gardens. So they created you know, nice wide streets and, and lovely townhouses, and they left the poor behind, mired in their filth back in the old town. So Edinburgh is a sort of a city of two halves, the old town and the new town. Um, so in answer to your question, yeah, once they built and started engineering over the top of the, of the old slopes and the, and the seven hills to create a flat surface, what had been there before disappeared out of sight. And so some of the old town was now sort of below ground level because they created a new level. So some of it was, was submerged, subterranean it became. So Edinburgh, it's fascinating for lots of reasons, but not least the fact that so much effort was put into tidying the place up and engineering out of sight a lot of the old structures. <laughs> 
What we're interested in though is specifically Salisbury Crags and Arthur's Seat because like the crag and tail, they are the product of ancient volcanic activity hundreds of millions of years ago. And what's significant, what matters in terms of you know, Edinburgh's contribution to world history in a way, there came to be born and to grow up in Edinburgh a chap called James Hutton. And James Hutton was, uh, was born to wealth. So like various other characters that, that made a great contribution, you know, like Isaac Newton and uh, Charles Darwin, as well as being clever, they crucially had the, the money, the wealth that meant they didn't have to work. Who knows how many men and women of genius weren't able to make their contribution because they were born into poverty and they couldn't indulge and, and exercise their genius because they had to work and so they would be out getting their backs broken in the fields or in the mines or whatever. So who knows whose contributions we didn't get. But James Hutton was one of those who was born with money and so he was able to give his time over to thinking and looking around himself. And, you know, he was undoubtedly an intellectual. And intellectuals are kind of, they look at and their attention is caught by things that most of us just walk past. They're sort of intellectual yokels. They sort of stand and gawp at things. Everyone else is just moseying on by, you know, too busy to notice. But, but these characters, they stand and stare. And really what captured Hutton's attention was the geology of Edinburgh. Everybody else was just living in it, getting on with things, getting on with their lives, getting on with the necessary things of life. But he looked around him and thought, there's something funny about all of that when I compare it to what I'm being told. Because Hutton in the 18th century, like everyone else at that time in our part of the world, he was raised with the absolute certainty that the planet was only 6,000 years old. Obviously, we know different. But up until relatively recently, the world was in thrall, the Christian world was in thrall to the teaching of the Old Testament, the creation that's described in Genesis. And specifically, there was a, a churchman, Archbishop James Usher, who set himself the task of reading the Old Testament with a view to adding together the lifetimes of all the ancient figures, Abraham and the rest, all the prophets, all the named figures whose lifetimes are described. You know, so-and-so lived to be 120 years old and, and whatever. So he stitched them all together for the first time and he worked his way back to Adam. Worked his way all the way back to the first lifetime that's described in the Old Testament. And he ended up working out believe it or not, that God created the world, that it all sparked into existence at about six o'clock in the evening of the 22nd of October, 4004 BC. Right? That's when the world began. So it's very precise. Not only was it bonkers, it was precisely bonkers. And so there you go. So if it started 4004 BC, by the, by the 18th century, add on 2,000 or so years more or less after the birth of Jesus Christ and you've got a planet, a universe, a creation that's about 6,000 years old. And so like everybody else that bothered to pay attention to the learning of the day, James Hutton had been told that the planet was 6,000 years old. But he simply looked at natural features like Salisbury Crags. Salisbury Crags is a, it's a cliff face. You know, it's dark rock and it's part of the approach that you walk past to go up to the top of Arthur's Seat, which is the big volcanic hill that dominates the skyline above Edinburgh. Salisbury Crags is the way. You know, you walk past Salisbury Crags to get up to Arthur's Seat and it's massive. It's hundreds of feet high, this cliff of, of basalt rock. And he looked at all of this and the plug of rock that the castle was sitting on and Arthur's Seat and it just didn't make sense to him that all of that could have happened in 6,000 years. He just intuited that it wasn't long enough. So as I say, people just accept what they're told and they look at the world around them and they say, yeah, that's nice, nice view, and then they get on with things. But Hutton just didn't. He was an intellectual yokel. 
and he looked and he open mouthed at it. Wait a minute. And so it got him thinking. So that would be a revolutionary thought then. Completely. Completely. He just before he before he was able to work out an explanation for his hypothesis, it just seemed to him instinctively that the rock of Edinburgh and the wider world, he, he travelled around the place. I mean, from, from that starting point, he travelled all over the British Isles, looking at the geology, looking at the natural formations, and persuaded himself that it had to be the work of an unimaginably longer period of time. Now, he didn't rule out, he never did rule out the presence of a god. You know, he wasn't an atheist, he was a, he was a deist, he, he believed in, in a god. But the God that he believed in was non-interventionist, wasn't meddling all the time, you know, wasn't going about the place fine-tuning, as we're told in the, you know, in the Bible. He, he just, Hutton d just didn't accept that. But it's not as though he got beyond the idea that, that the universe and, and everything that surrounds it was the work of a God. Because he believed that, but he just had a, an alternative, an alternative idea of, of what that God must have done and how long ago. But as I say, it wasn't just the geology of Edinburgh that showed him that. There's a lovely quote from him, Lord pity the arse that's fixed to a head that will hunt stones. You know, that's the, he's describing there the plight of the geologist. You know, he was driven to go all over the place on horseback, hence the sore arse. He was saddle sore because he had ridden and walked all over, all over the landscape, anywhere he, that attracted him. He looked and he took samples and he contemplated how the rock of ages might have been put together. But it was stimulated, he was triggered to do that by Edinburgh. And of course, it's worth sort of taking a, a little sidetrack and remembering that he was also, as well as being born wealthy and being born within sight of such fascinating geology as Edinburgh has, he was also alive and thinking at a time when Edinburgh was full of thinking people. It was the time of the Scottish Enlightenment. So during most of the second half of the 18th century, maybe a bit earlier than that, and then into the 1800s, Edinburgh was just buzzing with clever people. They attracted one another, they spent time together, and by being able to discuss their ideas about all sorts of aspects of the natural world, mathematics, the sciences... It created a momentum. Clever people were surrounded by clever people and it encouraged them to be even cleverer. And their ideas were bouncing off of each other like particles in a nuclear fission and fusion. It was all... Edinburgh was buzzing. It, ironically, that was still at the time of Old Reeky when the, when the old town was this filthy, cramped, unhygienic, unsanitary place. But it was, nonetheless, it was full of genius. There was genius in the mix and it was said that a person could stand at the market cross and within half an hour shake the hands of 50 men of genius. They were all there. And Voltaire, Voltaire, the French philosopher, said at that time, it is to Scotland that we look for our idea of civilization." At that time, in the whole firmament of thinking, Scotland, little Scotland, and particularly little stinking, filthy Edinburgh, was glowing, quite hot, with intellectual power. In the whole of the world, there was no place burning brighter than filthy old Riki. It's quite fascinating. And so it was in that sort of fertile, stinking, buzzing, fizzing place that his ideas were, were stimulated. But by being in that heady atmosphere, it wouldn't have happened, he wouldn't have happened if Edinburgh hadn't been like that at just the right time. He's been told from boyhood that the world's about 6,000 years old and he just knows, he just knows, before he works out why, that that can't be right. This nonsense that the world began at 6 o'clock on the evening of the 22nd of October, 4004 BC. I mean, how ridiculous does that sound anyway? But it was accepted wisdom. People believed it. Oh, yeah. So he was going against the current thought. 
Well, he began to go against it, yes. I mean, he, like, like so many others, he, like Darwin would and, and others, he, he got himself into trouble. Because anything that ran counter to the teaching of the church, especially in a place like Scotland, would get you into trouble. Because the church and Christianity and the word of God, it's infallible. How can it be wrong? So it's, it's a risky business. So there he was, he's looking at Salisbury Crags, he's looking up at Arthur's seat, he's looking at the crag and tail that the castle sits on. And he knows, he appreciates that they are the product of volcanic activity. And to begin with, he had no way of even beginning to calculate how old, how long the process had been going on. But what he intuited, I suppose more than anything else, was that rather than a god having created a perfect place 6,000 years ago, he understood that the natural world was in a constant state of flux. It was cyclical. And what he basically came to understand was that volcanic activity, which is going on right now, produces new rock. It spews out lava, which solidifies into new igneous rock. And from the moment it cools and becomes solid, it's subject to the forces of erosion sometimes glaciation, but even just rain and wind and all the rest of it. And that which had been rock is eventually ground down, broken. The bits make their way into the rivers and the rivers break them down even more and eventually the rivers take the sand and the sediment out to sea and it all ends up on the seabed and then the process all starts again. More volcanic activity creates more rock. So he understood that Edinburgh was the product of an ongoing process that Edinburgh wasn't finished. You know, it was a work in progress. And so he was just looking out at a, at a stage, a snapshot, and he knew that it would keep on evolving and keep on changing. And that that process of new rock emerging and eventually being turned to dust and washed out to sea was an ongoing cyclical process. It, fascinatingly, I mean, he's, he's, he's living and working a lifetime before Darwin, before Darwin's On the Origin of Species that completely radically and in every way changed our understanding of how creatures come to be as they are. Well, he came to broadly the same conclusion. And I can read you a, quite a lengthy quote about Hutton's thinking on living things. If an organised body is not in the situation and circumstances best adapted to its sustenance and propagation, then, in conceiving an indefinite variety among the individuals of that species, we must be assured that on the one hand, those which depart most from the best adapted constitution will be the most liable to perish, while on the other hand, those organised bodies which most approach to the best constitution for the present circumstances will be best adapted to continue in preserving themselves and multiplying the individuals of the race. Wow. So he's describing there about how if a species has millions and millions of examples, it will be those within it that are best suited to the environment in which they find themselves that will go on to have, in turn, the most offspring. And those least adapted will fall away. Hence, oversimplified notions like the survival of the fittest and all the rest of it. But... But Hutton was, as well as understanding the geology of the world around him, he was also coming to some of the same conclusions that would make Darwin so famous because he came up with a more complete explanation, not to mention that he was a, he was a much more comprehensible writer than Hutton. But, you know, this is, this is the extent of Hutton's cleverness. When it came to how he appreciated what was going on with the Rock of Edinburgh, he was laying the foundations of a, of a scientific theory that was built around that time called uniformitarianism, which is to say that there's a theory that the present day forces shaping the planet and the universe, the whole thing, had held sway in the past and would continue to do so in the future. So he said, we are thus led to see a circulation in the matter of this globe and a system of beautiful economy in the works of nature. And he, he spread that out into all of his thinking, that there was so much more going on than the oversimplified version of events in, in Genesis. The more he looked and the more he studied and the more he understood, he came to believe 
that the universe had no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. And no one had thought that before. According to Genesis, you know, God says, you know, let there be light and it all, it all kicks off. That there's a starting point. But uniformitarianism and, and the thinking of which Hutton was a, was a foundational part suggested that the, the universe might always have been there. You know, never mind a big bang. Uniformitarianism began to accept the possibility that there had just always been a universe. No beginning. And no end. Now, how revolutionary is that in a world in which people, everyone thinks that there's a God and God makes the universe? In the early evening of the 22nd of October, 4004 BC. But someone like Hutton stands up and says, no, no, the universe has always been here. It didn't start. It's always been here. And it will always be here. I mean, that was truly, truly revolutionary thinking. So he was at the forefront of what modern scientists call deep time. He's, he's grasping the idea of infinity. He, he, he's, he's beginning to get his head around the idea that the universe is limitless. And that within it is all the time and, and all the space that there will ever be. But far from imagining a concept like the Big Bang, or, or long before a concept of the Big Bang, which is another idea of a starting pistol, a time after which there is a universe, which implies a time before which there wasn't. Uniformitarianism, rather, accepted that the universe had just always been there. End of story. It's just there. And it's, it's one of those thoughts that you can't get your head around. Because we're finite creatures with a, you know, we're born and we live and we die. The idea of eternity and infinity is just, it's too big to fit inside your poor head. But Hutton, intuited the possibility of infinity and deep, deep time. My daughter, she's 18, she's gonna, she's just accepted a place to go to Edinburgh University. And it's due in no small part to the fact that she just wants to live in Edinburgh. And I did too. You know, I, I, I organised things so that I was able to live and work in Edinburgh for a while, various times over the years. And it was due in no small part to the fact that Edinburgh is a fantastic place to look at. And that fantasticness <laughs> is born of its, of its special geology. You know, the bones, the bare bones of the world are laid bare in Edinburgh. Go to the foot of the Royal Mile, down where the Palace of Holyrood House is. And if you're standing with your back to the gates, if you like, of, of the Palace of Holyrood House, and you're looking up at, at the Salisbury Crags, and from that perspective, they seem to loom, they seem to hang over the old town of Edinburgh. And if you do take yourself up past Salisbury Crags and up making for Arthur's seat, then what you're effectively doing is you're walking through the heart of a burned out volcano. You'll come past hexagonal columns like, you know, we talked about the Giant's Causeway. Same sort of thing. So the same processes that created those symmetrical columns of, of the Giant's Causeway, they're also in play in Salisbury Crags. And so you, you come up past a feature that's known in Edinburgh as Samson's Ribs. And then there's, there's also Hutton's section, named for Hutton, which is the point on Salisbury Crags that he paid particular attention to and that was foundational in giving him the understanding of the, of the geology of Edinburgh that he ended up with. But it's just so important what he did. And Salisbury Crags and Arthur's Seat and, and the Castle Rock, they win their place in the love letter to the British Isles because he and they, Hutton and those features, they enabled that man to begin answering questions that no one else had even thought to ask. Most of us go through life just accepting what we're told. How was the world made? Someone tells you. And you just accept it because it's coming down from someone that you accept is cleverer than you. It's so important to acknowledge the people that come along from time to time, men and women, who, unlike the rest of us, who just accept the uh, orthodoxy, 
we go to school, we're taught something and we accept it and we believe it for a lifetime. Thankfully, there are these individuals that come along that look at the evidence again and say to themselves and eventually to other people, I don't think so. I don't think that's right. And that's how knowledge and understanding progress. Because we never know enough. It's terrible laziness to think that our science right now, that the way that we understand the universe is correct. Because inevitably it won't be. Or at the very best, it's an incomplete picture. And it takes these unreasonable people who look at what they've been told and compare it to the world around them and say, no, that's not right. That's not good enough. And they refine the theory or they come up with a completely new theory and they develop it. And so Edinburgh and Hutton were a coming together of great importance. Arthur's seat, Salisbury Crags, they inspired Hutton to ask questions and to find answers to those questions that took us as a species a major step forward in understanding the world around us. And that's why those those places are in the love letter to the British Isles. Hunt was known as the father of geology, so this was a new science. Yes, I mean, he wasn't alone. It's always important to remember You know, in that same way that he was having some of the same inklings as Darwin would have later and do more with and explain more effectively, there were other people around who were looking at the world, who were looking at the mountains, who were looking at the the rocks and beginning in their own ways in other places at around the same time. They They were all, they were coming to the same conclusions. And Hutton was in contact with some of those figures. And that's important, you know, an isolated genius with no one to talk to, you know, quite often their ideas, they will spark into existence, but without tinder and kindling around them, the spark just doesn't come to anything. There has to be other flammable material around the spark for it to take hold and become a burning light that lasts. And so Hutton, although he was a key figure, there were others around him at the same time who were saying, wait a minute, it was the time was right. It was the time of the enlightenment in Scotland and so many clever people were looking around and saying wait a minute you know this idea we've all been told to believe the the, the creation myth of the Old Testament but it's not enough and so there were plenty of them and and the ideas had come and gone I mean from the ancient Greeks and, and onwards there were always people there have always been people who say wait a minute it can't be that simple. <laughs> you know, that's not, en- that's not enough. There's something much more complicated going on. Give me a minute. Give me a minute to think about that. But you need this kind of critical mass. You need enough like-minded, questioning, inquiring people bouncing off of each other in the same place at the same time. And that's what you had during the Scottish Enlightenment. You know, there were enough of these characters together for their individual ideas to catch light and last. Step from one hemisphere to another in the blink of an eye. Stand beside Henry VIII's hunting lodge. Step into an observatory built by the great architect Christopher Wren which was at the forefront of science for nearly two centuries. Mapping stars and planets and searching for time itself. Stand next to a legendary soldier and appreciate a breathtaking view towards a dynamic city with an ever-changing history. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. And please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. 
Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.